One thing I wanted to share in this live is um, we all know the importance in Hinduism we call it the Vata Varana, Swamji calls it the Vata Varana, means the ambience, the ambience, the atmosphere, what surrounds you, the ecosystem in which you, uh, in which you are, what is surrounding you. And one of the main clicks I got is, see Swamiji is reviving Kailasa, uh, the Hindu nation, the enlightened ecosystem. For those who are interested to know more about it, check the links in the description, kailasa.org, you can learn uh, a lot of interesting stuff. You can read and go through the website. And um, I was contemplating on what is an enlightened ecosystem from what Swamji has shared. And the click I got is What you re so in in Hinduism, one of the uh, important, uh, I, I guess, mahavakya or saying is uh, smaranat mukti, remembrance liberates. And some of you were sharing that Hinduism is a tradition which is moksha centered, liberation centered. So the purpose of Hinduism is to make you experience liberation, which is the purpose for which you assume the human body. So. And in the ecosystem, the enlightened ecosystem, you're constantly engaging with Paramashiva, with the ultimate, with Lord Shiva. And Swamiji was sharing, Hinduism is a uh, is celebration oriented. You're constantly made active in the space of celebration towards Paramashiva, towards the ultimate. He will say like 300 days a year you would have some form of festival, some form of celebration. And the 65 days which are misleft are basically the preparation days for each celebration. So the click I had was, see what you do, what, the, what you remember in the name of what you're doing is very important. If you're doing something and you remember money, then money becomes the uh one of the center focus point of your in your inner space but when you do something for paramashiva you constantly remember paramashiva you're acting you're becoming alive your muscle memory your bio memory everything is active made to be active from the context of paramashiva so what does that do that makes you remember paramashiva all the time and when you remember Paramashiva all the time, you don't get stuck into silly sufferings and incompletions of life because you remember the bigger picture. You don't get stuck into small situation like losing the like horses, you know, they have blinders where they just see a certain uh, fraction of what is in front of them because of these blinders. But and that's what we do unless we remember Paramashiva the ultimate we uh, we function with blinders we focus on certain things and we miss a lot of things because of that but when you remember the the powerfulness the vastness the omnipresent dimension of paramashiva uh, by remembering paramashiva these blinders fade away more and more and the more these blinders fade away the more you can see the bigger picture the more you can see the bigger picture the more you can figure out what you're doing why you're here what is the purpose of this whole thing and what should I be doing? And you can make uh, decisions from the space of uh, awareness, from the space of consciousness, from the space of oneness with Paramashiva, with the Guru. And like that, you evolve, you live a blissful life. You live a blissful life. So this ecosystem, the surroundings is very important. So Anji was saying that one of the major components which made his avataric mission happen even possible is because he was brought up in an enlightened ecosystem of Tiruvannamalai, which is unfortunately today has lost a lot of its authenticity, but still. Um, Swanji was sharing that it is so important and that's what he wants to create for everybody. Everybody who is sincerely interested in experiencing his, uh, the consciousness that you are, um, you need to have 
a surrounding which supports you and that is why the building of Kailasa is such an important happening and Swamji is working day and night to make that happen and it's happening I mean Kailasa is already established and is expanding more and more uh, in a worldwide scale so that's one of the clicks I wanted to share so the more you remember Paramashiva see when you when you pluck flowers to make garlands for Paramashiva when you cook or cook or cut fruits you know to offer food to the deities when you sew clothes for the deities where you whatever you do from the context because uh, an enlightened ecosystem is a temple based ecosystem means the temple is the center of the activities and the people so everything that people do it's always oriented towards the temple See, before you cook the food and consume the food, you will offer it to the deities, then you will consume it. So it's not like you're, everything is made available for everybody in a, in a big way. Uh, but it's always from the context of Paramashiva, of the ultimate. And it's always offered and then uh, consumed or used or whatever it is. So it was a, such a beautiful self-sustaining lifestyle which uh, didn't depend on anything. And that's why India was so rich before the invaders came because they were self-sustainable and they were only focused on, on experiencing the ultimate. They were not lost into creating um, superficial things uh, which, had no, which, which would distract you from the purpose for which you assumed the human body. So that's one of the major clicks I got and I wanted to share here with all of you. Um, if you have any questions, again, this is an open live session, whatever I share, you can ask or even if it's personal questions or whatever it is that you're uh, that you're encountering in your life or some questions you have that you've been having for quite some time you can share and uh, I can share whatever cognitive shifts or clicks I uh, I experienced and got since I've been with Swamiji the last few years being trained as a Brahmachari lifestyle of sannyas so it's a beautiful thing how beneficial it is to consume Haritaki daily? Very good question. So for those who don't know Haritaki, Haritaki is basically a powder you consume with uh, water preferably, otherwise any liquid. And um, it goes under the name Karikapudi in Tamil, if I'm not mistaken. Um, in, in, the, in the West, sometimes you can find it under the name uh, Hardy powder, H-A-R-D-E powder. And basically, Haritaki is God in the powder form. <laughs> Literally, it is God in the powder form. That's what Swamiji was sharing. And the purpose of Haritaki is to detox the body intensely. So it is like, it's the one of the most crucial component of a of, of, of detox anybody who wants to sincerely experience detox um, so that the body can be uh, obviously freed from toxins so that you can experience your consciousness and that you can realize more and more how you can manifest the reality you want to create for yourself Haritaki is very important there are many things that it does and I can share also some of my experiences uh, one thing that it does is it increases the uh, quantity of oxygen that you that the body absorbs so when you breathe you have a certain amount of oxygen going in going out but from that amount there's only a certain percentage which gets absorbed so Haritaki makes that percentage triple it triples the percentage of that amount of oxygen that your lungs can absorb and 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 transform into whatever is useful it is for the body and uh, so that itself is a huge thing because oxygen is very important we all know to have a healthy brain to have a healthy blood and if you don't have a healthy blood and you don't have a healthy brain well you don't have a healthy life so <laughs> these are the fundamental things healthy blood is very important healthy blood is very important so and the blood obviously fuels the brain it fuels the heart it fuels everything so uh, Purifying the blood is one of the main thing that Haritaki does. Swamiji has been uh, attacked and has been uh, has suffered poisoning uh, when uh, murder attempts were made on him, and he shared that Haritaki was one of the main 
her main component of uh, main thing res one of the main things responsible for uh, removing all the toxins generated by the poisons in the body so that it left it, uh, it left his body so haritaki is very very powerful um, it will first it will also obviously uh, one of the effects you will see is it will uh, help you eliminate the stools in your system so you will uh, see basically when you consume food it should leave your body as soon as possible it shouldn't stay in your body but unfortunately when we, we are not uh, raised in a healthy way so we don't have that kind of health where the body leaves the where the food leaves the body um, ASAP there's actually some Tamil saint which Swamiji was quoting and he was saying that if you want to if you never want to be sick in your life don't eat until the last meal has left your body so that just gives a, a perspective of like how it functions so haritaki helps you to make the whole flow of digestion and excretion um, as fast as possible so that the body doesn't have to use more energy than it needs to process the food and the toxins don't get uh, generated in the body because when the food is being digested and is turning into stools then uh, if it sits inside your system for one or two days uh, the, a lot of the toxins which are stored in these stools will be reabsorbed by the guts because the guts the walls of the guts actually absorb stuff they're very sensitive so they also absorb back the, some of the toxins so that's not that's definitely not good so that's why if you can if you can flush the food which um, which you have consumed as fast as possible is a very very important part in order to create a yogic body for yourself so haritaki is one of the main components uh, along with castor oil for that um, I can also share from my personal experience Okay, then we have another question also regarding kumkum and third eye. I'll just uh, finish sharing about haritaki. Um, haritaki also from a, from like an inner space spiritual angle more um, other than the yogic dimension of it. The haritaki breaks your your resistance. Because haritaki is a very strong, st uh, very strong taste. If you are not used to it, you will, uh, you most likely won't. <laughs> well, even if you take it, uh, haritaki is a, a very unique and strong taste. And naturally, if you don't have the right context, your mind will tell you, "I don't want to take it." Even though it's, it doesn't last long. It's like, a, it's like literally like a forty-second experience or something. Uh, your mind will tell you no I don't want to no. unless you have the right context if you have the right context then you'll be able to be ferocious with your mind and just drop the mind and take it but if you don't have the right understanding and the right context then uh, you might have resistance towards that so one of the experiences that I personally had was um, it breaks that resistance it helps you to develop that ferociousness where you uh, put priority towards what you decide is good for you rather than what you feel is pleasurable for you because sometimes pleasurable things are not good for you and if pleasure is your priority then you will go with pleasurable things but you might have temporary pleasures but you'll have uh, in the long run you'll have uh, bad health or you'll have negative stuff in your life so going for the good over the pleasant is always very important especially in the process of keeping your body healthy in a, in a yogic body state so that's one of the thing it really helps to uh, break your mind and it re it keeps you awake also it keeps you awake if you have also like if you feel like stomach weird feelings in the stomach or your stomach is upset and all that just take haritaki and it will it within like 30 minutes everything will be solved it really has a power over the stomach Especially when you start to do fasting and you want to break your food patterns. Sometimes the, the stomach goes a little cranky and all that. Uh, you take haritaki and that just within like 20 minutes, 30 minutes, it just removes everything and it puts you back to a space of peace and very light as well. So these are the some of the few things I can share about haritaki. Yes.
Um, I'll just go on to this question first. We have another one also. Um, yes. Wearing, that's great. That's great. Haritakis must take it for literally like Haritaki, castor oil, and neem juice are ultimate to create uh, internal or uh, yogic internal organs body. Or internal organs are very important because we don't see them, because we don't experience them, and we don't know what they do, and we cannot differ differentiate what are what is who is doing or what is doing what inside of you. We just kind of forget them. But internal organs is like if you don't have a, a healthy body. Um, you will not be able to carry the tasks you wish to carry properly. It's very simple. I mean, it's a, it's a basic logic. It's like your vehicle, right? If your car is not running properly, then you won't be able to go where you want to go in a smooth way. So the same goes with the body. So taking the body uh, seriously and really uh, maintaining the body in a high level of, um, of health. Even in Hinduism, we don't say like without disease does not mean health. They say radiating health. So it's a different perspective, right? It's not about without disease means health. It means like if you if health is expressed and that's why you can see that when people are healthy, they have a certain shine to them. That shine is a sign of radiating health. So that's very important. Yes, Nityanandam, hi. Um, wearing kumkum on the third eye. Uh, it has also various uh, reasons. Obviously, the processed kumkum is basically processed turmeric. And when you wear it on your third eye, it helps to decalcify the pineal gland, which, uh, which helps for the, um, for the awakening of the third eye, which facilitates the manifestation of the powers of third eye. Uh, and it allows the initiation into third eye to happen smoothly and the expression to be more and more uh, powerful. Because a lot of the, some of the food and especially the water that we consume um, actually calcifies the pineal gland. And a, a pineal gland is a gland in the brain, which is the, which is to a certain extent related to the third eye. So obviously bringing that gland back to a, again, very strong and healthy space is important. And kumkum does that. So you see sometimes people wearing some Hindus, they wear these uh, stickers, right? These red stickers just for the kind of the social kind of thing where you see the mark, but you don't have the benefit. It's not just a social thing. You're supposed to apply kumkum, not just put a sticker because there's a science behind it that makes your life go to the next level. So that's one of the reasons. Another reason is also for remembering. Swamji says kumkum kum -kum is Devi. Uh, Basma is Shiva. So Kumkum, when you apply it, you remember that Devi, Parashakti, resides in this body and expresses through this body. This remembrance is very important for you to drop self-doubt, self-hatred, self-denial, or not to experience powerlessness when you are facing certain situations in which you are shaken. So the dimension of remembrance is also, uh, is also very important. So that is why... Uh, that is why everything in the Vedic tradition, everything in Hinduism is, has, a, has a meaning and a practical benefit to your life into all dimensions, whether it is the, the mental dimension, the conscious dimension, the physical dimension, it all has different things which aligns you to purify yourself so that you can experience the super consciousness, Paramashiva, which you are. Uh, but you have to realize that for, for, it, for, for it to for it to be real to you. Otherwise, you feel your body is more real than your consciousness. But that is not uh, that is not the truth. That is not the reality. So it helps us to when you detox the body, you whether it is through Haritaki or Kum Kum or this, there are basically diff, diff, uh, different ways of detoxing the body. And when you detox the body, you are no longer controlled by your senses you regain powerfulness over your senses. Otherwise, your senses rule the game. When your tongue suddenly wants to experience something, the tongue commands the brain. It'll tell you, well, I want this, you give me this now, and you'll go and snack and eat whatever taste the tongue wants. So like you're, you're literally controlled by your senses when your body is full of toxins. 
So the more you do detox, the more you regain powerfulness over your senses and you can decide what, what is aligned to what you want, what is not aligned to what you want and you will not be controlled by impulses or like strong, uh, random, spontaneous desires which just take over your mind and your inner space and make you lose focus on whatever you're doing and just disturbs you in so many ways. So that's an important thing. Yes, I'll talk about the sacred ash in a moment. I'll just go to another question. Um, can you talk about avoiding spiritual ego, the feeling of superiority over beings who are still in delusion? Yes, that's a very good question. Let's just unclutch for a moment. Remembering Swamiji, Guru, Paramashiva. And that we are that Paramashiva as well. Paramashiva is not exclusive, he is all inclusive. That's why Swamiji recently translated or mapped uh, Paramashivoham meaning I am Paramashiva and he translated it in English saying I am Paramashiva also which means you are too. So coming back to that space for a few moments raising beyond the thoughts activities emotional activities untouched like a bird is untouched by traffic you remain untouched from thoughts and emotions. So one of the first thing I, I which uh, is a cognitive shift and a click for me regarding this spiritual ego. See, when you start to learn about spirituality, you start to learn about new um, concepts initially and uh, you start to have perhaps experiences which are very much different than what you normally uh, used to have and that perhaps people around you um, have and um, you start to learn spiritual truths which are of higher nature than the fundamental understandings that we have when we live uh, just a mundane life and you can easily start to feel that uh, you can easily start to feel superior to people around you because you feel oh they are still in delusion um, and one of the clicks I have is if you feel that superior to people around you because they're still in delusion well you're also in the same delusion and the click I had was that when you are when you are when you cross delusion you are in the space of compassion if you are in the space of superiority, it means you are just in another level of delusion. That's all. But delusion is delusion. End of the day, it doesn't matter which level of delusion you're in. Delusion is delusion and all delusion has to be uh, discarded, dispelled. And when you are beyond delusion, you are compassionate. So as long as compassion is not oozing out from your being and you do not make decisions and actions and from the space of compassion, there is a form of delusion. So that's one of the clicks I got regarding this. Um, because end of the day, we are consciousness. When you realize that you are that consciousness in this body, the same consciousness is in that body also. So like feeling superior to that body is basically like you cut your own limb which is not right of course Swamiji was sharing as a, when you assume the human body you are given the right the freedom of uh, of doing whatever you want you have the freedom and in other realms in other lokas that freedom is not given it is only given to the to the beings who assume a human body on this plane so the thing is that when you are deluded and you have that you use this freedom to delude yourself and Swamiji was sharing that and that is part of the process for you to realize to for you to experience liberation because you have to realize that uh, even though you have the power of freedom you should surrender it back to Paramashiva but before you come to the realization that you have to surrender it back 
you have to first delude yourself in it and create suffering for yourself. When you start to create suffering for yourself, at some point you can no longer handle it because you do not have the pure knowledge uh, of Paramashiva. And at that point, you have to, you will slowly start to come to the realization that you have to give it back. That power of freedom, if it is not used from the space of Paramashivoham, from the space of pure powerfulness, you will just hurt yourself with it. So that was one of the main things, that's the main clarity Swamiji gave. And when I, when he shared that, I was like, oh my God, that, that like explains so many things of like how so many questions are just dispelled by this understanding of freedom and uh, incomplete knowledge in the Vedas, in the scriptures, Hindu scriptures, uh, they talk about avidya, which is incomplete knowledge. And when they talk about avidya, actually, they talk about spiritual ego, where they say that people will use spiritual understandings, spiritual principles, spiritual truths to declare supremacy over others. But the purpose of spiritual truth is not for you to declare your supremacy over others. The purpose of the spiritual truth is for you to realize you are Paramashiva and bring people to that state. So if you use that truth for, for selfish purpose, it is called avidya, incomplete knowledge. And that incomplete knowledge is very difficult to, this, to get rid of because you become so cunning. And, and that cunningness... Uh, that cunningness only like uh, that cunningness takes time to get removed and most of the time like Kalabairava will have to come in some form and some form of intense happening would have to happen in your life for you to be shaken to the point where you start to you know decide okay maybe I shouldn't function like this anymore and then the process of you know experience of cherishing devotion gratitude surrender uh, becomes something that makes sense to you when that when that shift starts to happen these dimensions which by default would not make sense to a, a mundane person uh the devotion surrender gratitude i mean they're not initially uh necessarily something that appeals to people and something that people want to uh create in their life more and more but at some point uh when you have certain realizations or you know when certain uh, thought patterns and karmas get removed from you or get cleansed or you exhaust them then you start to realize that yes these dimensions are very important and I should cherish them and grow in these dimensions as well not just in the other uh, mundane uh, world worldly dimensions so um, so avidya in they say in the scriptures is very difficult to get rid of so having the right context of why you're getting this because some people they study spiritual truth just to to see for instance if somebody has a pattern they feel uh, I'll give an example okay somebody that's a purely created example somebody who stutters right he has a shock when he's a child he's strongly emotionally impacted and uh, the result of that impact is that his body starts to create the muscle memory starts to create a, a pattern of stuttering and then the, the person stutters. So when the person speaks, maybe he will face people who will be making fun of him and he will feel like he doesn't have the confidence to speak and all that and that will affect him in various ways in his life. So he can develop a strong inferiority complex because of that pattern. And if he does not get the chance of meeting an enlightened being, an avatar, and get introduced and initiated into the science of completion, he cannot free himself from the trauma which caused the stuttering pattern to be developed. So what he does instead is he, he, he works to uh, compensate for that feeling of inferiority by showing how great he is to people in a certain way. And one of the ways could be learning about spiritual truth. Okay, so he learns about the spiritual truth and he talks about the spiritual truth. But the purpose for which he learned and shares the spiritual truth is not from the space of compassion. It is from a space of compensation. It's like he just wants to feel good about himself and show to people that you guys are making fun of me because of my stuttering thing. But look how intelligent I am. So that's an example, uh, an example of how, you know, you can engage into uh, spiritual truths but from the wrong context and when you don't have the right context then naturally you do not experience the right uh, you don't experience fulfillment and then it's a it's a 
it's like it's a loop which never ends because it, it, it is based on some form of vengeance because you feel that you know people are seeing you in a certain way judging you in a certain way thinking of you in a certain way you kind of feel very hurt about that because because that's not who you are but at the same time you don't know how to make these people shift and understand so there's a form of uh, vengeance which starts to generate inside the inner space and then we want to prove ourselves you know we get into that oh i'm going to show the people i'm going to show the world i'm going to you know so this is kind of a vengeful state where we uh when yeah where the ego thrives but the thing is that it never brings fulfillment because it, it it's always rooted in the powerlessness so the only way to free yourself from this whole negative cycle is to actually uh first to be introduced into your consciousness get initiated into your consciousness and then uh and then and then dispel the root of the whole happening which is whatever uh, trauma and cognition that the, the that being would have gotten as a child uh, which was the starting point for this whole thing to evolve so the best way to get rid of spiritual ego is guru that's why guru disciple relationship is so important and is the backbone of hinduism when you when you ego means you want to do things your way but your way comes with all the, all the karmas that you carry in your bio memory all these karmas will dictate how you cognize your way so as long as you do your way you're you're stuck with your own karmas and at some point you feel like it's too much and you can't handle it you have it's like because these karmas become a load more and more load 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 and if you don't know how to get rid of them then uh then at some point you can't bear it anymore so when you have guru then you start to follow Guru, Guru's words, the Guru Vak. So when you follow Guru's words, it is not the words you give to you. So the Guru's words come from the space of the Guru, which is not the space you're in. So by aligning to the words of the Guru, you drop your space. And at the same time, you drop all the karmas associated to your space. And by doing that, you come... you. It's like you cleanse the, the, the sheet, everything, you reset everything. And then, you can re and then you restart with powerful cognitions. Because as a child, unfortunately, unless we were raised in the gurukul of an enlightened being or an avatar, uh, we are not taught the powerful cognitions. So we don't have the right understandings and cognitions about ourselves, about life, about people, about the world, about Paramashiva. We don't have the right cognitions. So when you don't have the right cognitions, you will not have the right conclusions. And if you don't have the right con and yeah, actually even Swamiji says that you don't need conclusions to live your life. Cognitions uh, is the only thing you need to live your life. So basically, powerful cognitions. And then when you when you like like I shared, if you drop, if you follow the Guru Vox, the Guru's words, you drop your ego. Because your ego means what you want to do. But then if, then if you say, okay, but once you surrender to Guru, once you start the path of surrendering towards Guru, then you follow his words. So his words might not be how you would do things, but that doesn't matter because at this point you decided to surrender. So you follow that. And then in that process, you, you, you disconnect, you free yourself from all the karmas which you carry in your bio memory and you start to, you create. That's why they say after you are initiated, you are... Uh, it's like a second birth. Even in the scriptures, they say the moment you get initiated, you're liberated. Then you just need to live. You just need to be integrated to Guru, and then you you'll never experience the karmas that you were that you had ever again, and you are free. And you can recreate a life with the powerful cognitions that the Guru uh, has infused in you. So that's why the Guru disciple relationship is the most beautiful and important process and is the root of hinduism and that's why when the anti-hindu forces worked towards destroying hinduism they are actively working to destroy the guru disciple relationship because that relationship is a part of the core of how the right knowledge vidya the right knowledge can be transmitted from one being to another so yes that's an amazing question actually i really like it so, feeling superior or inferior is delusion. 
If you feel lesser than, you are deluded. If you feel superior than, you are deluded. That's pious fraud Swamji has been talking about recently. So it's all about you are Paramashiva. There is no question of superiority or inferiority. Paramashiva is omnipresent. He exists within everything. He is all pervading. And he is causeless auspiciousness. So there is no such thing as superiority and inferiority. But the dualistic logic is always putting us into, you know, prey, predator, inferior, superior, good, bad. We are stuck in that dual mode. Like we are not able to cognize life beyond that dual mode. Because we are conditioned like that through language and through culture and all that stuff. But Hinduism is there to make us realize that no, life does not function with the dualistic logic. Your computer might function with one and zeros, but life does not function like a computer. So it's a multidimensional logic. So that's a very uh, important thing to constantly contemplate on and make it become our reality. It is actually already there, but we just need to, you know, drop whatever we are holding on to and come back to the original way of functioning. Yes. So... Yes. Like scales falling from the eye of the blind. That's what it is. But for that, yes. So that's why the guru-disciple relationship is so important. Because that's what happens. The more and more you integrate yourself to guru and live the initiations and words of guru, the more the different layers of delusion um, just disappear. They just melt. They just vanish. Because end of the day, it's delusion. So it doesn't need to be... Uh, it, it, it's not like... It's just a shift, but you have to um, hold the space for that shift to happen. Yes, we have another question talking about sacred ash, basma. So let's listen to Swamiji for a few seconds, remembering the context of unclutching. Decide to unclutch, not to follow any thoughts, emotions, Triggering of mind and mental activities inside. Even laziness is a mental activity. Tiredness is mental activity. Feeling bored is mental activity. Do not follow any of that. Just decide not to follow any mental activity and sit as you. The pure space. So basma, like I shared a little bit earlier with the kumkum, basma is basically the representation of Paramashiva. Um, and again, it has physical benefits and it has um, cognitive benefits. Um, one thing that it does is that it removes the, a lot of humidity from the head because basically sacred ashes, it's very dry. And uh, it helps to regulate the level of humidity in your head, in your brain, basically, which helps to keep the brain uh, in a healthy state. That is one of the benefit uh, I've heard that sacred ash does. And um, but for me, the main thing is remembering Paramashiva in various ways. One of the ways is that end of the day, all the things around you will disappear. They will all come back to ashes. So it reminds you that everything is a delusion. Not, not to say that you should not engage with life because everything is a delusion, but you should engage with life because being life positive is mandatory in order to be in a space of completion. You should engage with life, but with the remembrance that everything is a delusion. Therefore, no fear, anxiety, anger, nothing can, no lower emotions or frequencies can touch you because you know that end of the day it's a delusion. Fear cannot come and take over your heart and, and squeeze and just cage your heart because, uh, because you know that the object which is generating fear is end of the day, it's a delusion. So there's no reason for you to be afraid or to generate fear. You can just do what you need to do and manifest whatever you, uh, you want to manifest through this interaction with a person or situation, whatever it is. So this context of remembering that Paramashiva is real 
and at the end of the day, all, everything in this world is going to come back to ashes. Of course, there's a reason why this world exists and there's a purpose why we assume the human body. We have to fulfill that purpose. That is why we decided to assume the human body in the first place. But in the process of fulfilling that, remember that everything is a delusion. It is not ultimate. So that you can root your inner space into the ultimate, into Paramashiva and not into something of this world which will leave you hanging because end of the day it is a delusion. So that's one of the powerful cognition regarding applying a uh, sacred ash or basma which uh, really clicked with me and really brings a lot of uh, powerfulness. One of the other thing also which really clicked with me with uh, uh, Um, uh, regarding Basma is that one of the for me one of the form one of the ways that Shiva really Parama Shiva really impacted me is the when he sits on the cremation ground covered in Basma and for me when I when I when this visualization is remembered it it reminds me again of this you know he's beyond everything he doesn't need anything from this world so he d there's no form of powerlessness of feeling dependent on anything. He is the source of his own happening. He is the source of his own bliss. He engages with the world, but he's not deluded about the world. He does not believe that the world is something that the world is not. He knows exactly what the world is and he engages with the world playfully, knowing that it is a delusion, but he plays within the delusion, but never gets deluded in the process because he is in the space of the ultimate in space of Paramashivoam. So also Basma for me really means that. Means that you know the truth. You can see through the delusion and you can engage with the world with a, from the right space, from a powerful space, from an innocent space, from a, a pure space, a sincere space without um, carrying any form of delusion. So the remembrance of that really brings the completion back to the inner space right away it's very powerful to bring so that's why a lot of in hinduism we have a lot of it's very externalized you know the, your spirituality is very externalized you have marks you have kavi you have rudrakshas you have malas you have tiger skin you have jatas you have so much stuff but it's not because it's to be flashy or to look no it's for you to remember Remember these powerful cognitions so that you can completely root yourself in them and never be shaken by anything and live the life that you need to live. So it's like it's not like superfluous stuff which is just flashy and all that. No, it has a meaning. Not only it helps for the detox process such as like kumkum or basma or all these things, but it is also there for you to remind you of the ultimate so that you don't get deluded more and you get out of your delusion until you are liberated. So it's a very beautiful and powerful process. Hinduism is amazing. Initially, initially it can look like very like, well, disorienting because it's so different and it's so out there in the way that it projects itself. But when you start to really grasp the context and connect and develop feeling connection with it, it's, it's by far as far as I'm concerned, the most mature uh, tradition available on planet Earth. I mean, it's the oldest one also still available and there's a reason for it because it's just pure. It's authentic. It is what it is. Of course, it's in a bad shape in today, today's world. So that's why, you know, Swamji is there and that's why we're working hard to revive the Hindu nation um, and the enlightened ecosystem that Hinduism creates. But none of the less, it is the most uh, powerful uh, civilization no other ancient civilization has survived the modern day other than hinduism hinduism is the only ancient tradition still alive in today's world and uh there's a reason for that because it's amazing <laughs> yes um so we have some more questions more questions does swamiji recommend his disciples to practice shivambhu kalpa or urine therapy. Now, I personally never heard Swamiji mentioning about that, so 
I can I would say no. Uh, does Swamiji encourage disciples to see? Yeah, sun gazing. He did mention it at some points. So sun gazing helps uh, when the sun rises and when the sun falls. It's a it's a yogic technique to heal the eyes and to develop certain uh, to awaken certain powers that are relating to the eyesight. So yeah, there's another question. I'm not sure if I understand it properly, but uh, it's a joke to think about the uselessness of this and that. Uh, lol, I have what I have and nothing to trade. It would be nice to be supplied with all these things, but I guess that's that. So how I'm grasping this question is that it's not that things are useless. It's not about the uselessness of things. It's it's about uh, there's a form of delusion which comes with these things. The thing itself is not a problem, but the delusion is a problem. So if you need a house, if you need a shelter to protect the body from whatever, that's fine. Because because the because we like we cannot say this world is a delusion and therefore is useless. No, delusion does not mean useless. Delusion means it deludes you. It puts you into the wrong space, the wrong understanding, which you end up hurting yourself with because of ignorance. So it's not about things are not useless. Things have their purpose. But there is a certain form of delusion which comes with it. And that delusion should not, you should not, you should engage with the thing, but you should not engage with the delusion. So for that, initiation, guru, and uh, is is required for you to break free from the uh, from the delusion because otherwise if you start to cognize things as being useless you become very life negative you withdraw from life you drop everything and that is not the right context another cognition i'd like to share that this uh, this statement reminds me of is um Everything that you need in your life to get what you want is available to you. But it's just that you don't see it because of that delusion. So that is why consciously working to manifest your reality is very important. Because uh, in the process of consciously working towards manifesting your reality, you break free from these uh, layers of delusion and you realize that actually everything you need to get what you want in life is around you and is available. You have everything that you need to make it happen. There's nothing that you're lacking. There's nothing that you don't have and because of that you're not able to get what you want. This is a form of delusion which uh, w which everybody uh, is engaged with until uh, until enlightenment. So, so that's a very powerful cognition to remember. In the Jain tradition, Swamji was sharing that in the Jain tradition they say they uh, the when they get initiated they get into initiated into the powerful cognition that when you are when you assume the human body everything that you will need for your entire life is sent to planet earth along with you so everything that you need to fulfill the purpose of your life has been sent with you so there's no question of cognizing that there's not what you need for your life to reach its uh, fulfillment, its completion. Everything has been sent with you. So, so that breaks these, uh, these cognitions of, you know, life is not fair. I don't have what I need. Life is not giving me what, I, what is required. And all these powerless cognitions that we can get stuck into. Um, we have to consciously work towards breaking free from all these things. Any form of delusion, guru is required. That's what I that that's what I would share. Uh, guru pulls you out of all delusions. Guru is a manifestation of your seeking. Guru is the answer of your seeking. If you seek to get out of delusion, you will manifest guru in your life. No doubt about it. You will manifest guru in your life. Guru is the embodiment, like I was sharing in previous uh, sharings, Swamiji was sharing that Paramashiva is the unmanifest, Guru is the manifested part of Paramashiva. So they're one and the same, it's an extension. 
an extension you can relate to easily because you're in the human body so you can relate to another human body easily um, but that's what it is and that's why the guru disciple relationship is so important another thought current I can um, share also regarding these comments which I'm not sure if anyways uh, another thing I can share is nobody can force anything upon you unless you decide to tag along with it we have we are taught this idea that we are there's a f there's a dimension of us which is completely powerless and through this dimension things outside of us can come and take control of us but that's not the truth and that is why contemplating on uh, what the scriptures shares and the powerful cognitions that Swamiji shares is so important because um, you have to re you have to constantly cognize that you are consciousness and there's nothing beyond consciousness consciousness is beyond everything which you can imagine which you can see which you can imagine which you cannot imagine it's beyond everything so there's nothing beyond consciousness and you are that consciousness so there's nothing which can be force forcibly put onto you unless you give some form of agreement to it so then it's all about like working towards how do I shift? How do I um, consciously create what I want and not give um, yes to things which I don't want, but I feel that I don't have a choice for various reasons and I'm bound to say yes to. So this is a form of powerlessness also which, uh, which we need to attend to individually as, we, as, you, you know, as you grow into the space of completion. Yes, the question is, is it alright to work for your personal enlightenment and not care of others or problems in the world? I mean, the purpose of life is to is for liberation, end of the day. Um, it, is, it is for liberation of the being. So I, I, I wouldn't say like it's right or wrong. It's not about right or wrong. It's just like when you, you, when you, when you sink in from the space of completion, when you sink into your being, whatever you cognize as your integrity towards Paramashiva, towards Guru, align to that. If that changes, that changes. If that does not change, that does not change. But that's fine. But you just be integrated to what you cognize and constantly expand your cognition. Constantly expand your cognition and consciously, consistently constantly be integrated to what you cognize otherwise if in this in this in this realm of right or wrong and all that you start to do like you start to experience you know different forms of guilt or you feel forced or you feel suppressed or you feel um there's different forms of incompletions which 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 flourish uh in that space so it's not about being right or wrong it's about to be integrated to what you cognize you listen to guru you cognize what Guru is sharing. You internal, internalize. You internalize inside. You analyze inter, internally. Internalize. So you internalize and whatever comes out, then you live that. In Hinduism, we have three things. Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana. Shravana means listen. Means listen to the Guru's words. Manana means internalize. Means meditate, contemplate, digest these words inside of you. And whatever clicks, whatever understanding, whatever cognitive shift you have, implement that in your life. That's all. Don't worry about the rest. Keep listening to Guru. Keep the Shravana alive. Keep the Manana alive. And keep radiating whatever is the fruit of your Manana, of your internalization. So the, it's not about like, you know, because the way, sometimes we... It's not about like, oh, I'm more, I'm less, this is good, this is right, this is wrong. No, whatever you cognize, you align to that. And, and you grow and you experience life, that's all. You align to Guru more and more. The more you align to Guru, the more your inner space expands. The more inner space expands, the more fulfillment happens, is experienced. The more you're fulfilled, the more you're blissful. The more you're blissful, you're blissful. <laughs> Nothing else than that. <laughs> 
for those who are actually interested in experiencing um, a space which is held for you, for you to have, you know, uh, deeper experiences of your consciousness, I would recommend for you to check the links in the description below. Paramashivoham.org is basically uh, a 16 day program where you are in an environment which supports you to practice uh, these principles and these techniques for you to have a cognitive shift in your life, uh, a super conscious breakthrough. So like I was sharing, Swamiji says knowledge is free. Knowledge is available on the internet. Swamiji is uh, everything that he shares is available on YouTube on in, in uh, again in the description. You have the Nityananda Media House in Kailash, which has clips of Swamji satsangs. Each of these clips are also directly linked to the um, original satsang on Swamji's uh, YouTube channel. So you can check both channels and um, all the teachings are there. But teachings is, is, the, is one important thing, but it's like the seed, right? The teaching is the seed. Um, it's a form of seed, but you, you need to have a fertile ground for that seed to grow faster. So the Vatavarana, the ambience that is held around you for that seed to give its fruits uh, and for you to have an experience and a cognitive shift for that um, being in, a, in, a, in the right atmosphere is important. So that's why uh, programs such as Paramashivoham um, are very much required at some point uh, to bring the next level breakthrough. Uh, in your life. So inviting you to check it. Another important dimension to really put our lifetime and energy into is the ferociousness. We have to be ferocious towards what we decide to do. Ferociousness is, uh, some of you were sharing, it has nothing to do with anger and all that. It's a non-violent space, but it's a space where Nothing can shake you. Once you've decided something, you're unshakable. And nothing can, can destroy your intention. So ferociousness is something very important to contemplate on and implement in our life, in whatever we decide to do for ourselves. You should not allow any form of self-doubt, self-hatred, self-denial to perturb you. Only the ferocious intention to manifest what you decided to manifest that should be kept alive and uh, remembering the guru and remembering the guru going on that path with ferociousness Fero ferociousness is also one of the for me at least one of the symbols of paramashiva paramashiva is very ferocious um, he's not angry he's not violent he doesn't want to hurt anybody. He doesn't have any form of vengeance or anything. But when he decides something, it's happening. Nothing else can be done about it. So it's like, it's a, it's a, str it's a space of powerfulness. We have incarnations of Paramashiva such as Virabhadra, uh, Kalabhairava, uh, Rudra, um, Sarabeshwara. Mahakal. You have various forms of Paramashiva which are the embodiment of that ferociousness. Munishwara. You have many forms of Paramashiva which are the embodiment of this ferociousness. And it's a very important component for you to, uh, to experience your consciousness, uh, to experience the space of Paramashivoham, and to uh, protect that space uh, for others who actually want to experience that space but have external things interfering with them and distracting them from uh, from the goal so that's very important so let's sit a few moments in the space of unclutching Decide to unclutch, not to follow any thoughts, emotions, triggering of mind and mental activities inside. 
even laziness is a mental activity tiredness is mental activity feeling bored is mental activity do not follow any of that just decide not to follow any mental activity and sit as you the pure space yes so with this we will close today's session hoping to see you tomorrow approximately same time so again live q and a if you have any questions if you go through anything during the day you can share and i can share uh, the various types of cognitive shifts or clicks i got regarding this question since i've been with swamji and after like all the initiations and all the sharings and everything that swamji has given us and uh, yes so with that being said don't forget that unclutching is a very important space that you are paramashiva everything else is pious fraud and with this we'll close with the purna mantra thank you again for being here om pur namadav pur namidam pur nat pur namudachyate pur nasya pur namadaya pur nameva vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Sarvam Bhagavad Shri Nityananda Paramashivam Padukarpa Namastu Om Nityanandam If you want to check out the Mahavakya Om Nityananda Paramashivam check the links Niti on the Midi House in Kailash in the description below. Don't forget, Guru, Swamiji was sharing devotion and cognition. Nityananda is Guru, devotion component. And Paramashivoham is Paramashiva, is the cosmic principle. And it is the truth. It is the powerful cognition. So cognitions, powerful cognitions and strong devotion. So with this, I'll see you in the next live. Thank you again for being here. Love and respects. Nitya Andam.